On today's show, we'll be joined by Overtime Elite City Reapers head coach David Aledo to discuss coaching both Amon and Asar Thompson and what makes them such special NBA draft prospects. We'll break down their playmaking ability, the concerns over their shooting, as well as the intangibles that they each bring to the table like leadership, work ethic, and much, much more. It's all coming up right here at Locked on Rockets. This is Mission Control, Houston. Ignition sequence start. The Houston Rockets select Jalen Green. Alperon Shengun and Jabari Smith Jr. T minus 15 seconds. Guidance is internal. Every time I step on that floor, I'm coming. Hey, Houston fans, I am so happy. You're getting somebody who's going to come in with a chip on their shoulder, somebody who's going to come, come in and compete from day one. Six, five, four, three, two, one. What's up and welcome to another edition of Lockdown Rockets, your daily podcast home for everything Houston Rockets basketball. As always, I'm your host, Jackson Gatlin, native Houstonian and credentialed media member. I'm also the host of Locked On NBA Mondays. Be sure to follow along on Twitter at JT Gatlin and the show, of course, at Lockdown Rockets, free and available wherever you listen to your podcasts, including YouTube. Just go to YouTube, search Lockdown Rockets. Be sure to like, comment, and subscribe. And as always, thank you so much for making Lockdown Rockets part of your day every single day, whether it's on the way to work, on your lunch break, in the Jim, thank you for making LOR part of your day every single day. Joining us now is the head coach of the Overtime Elite City Reapers, Dave Alato. Coach, very excited to have you on the program here with us today. Excited to be here. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. Well, let's let's go ahead and dive in. For, for those maybe a bit unfamiliar with OTE at this point, how would you best kind of describe the league and, and what it's kind of bringing to the table? Well, in, in order to do that, you kind of take a quick a quick rinse start to finish and how we started was with the thought process of creating a league that is so different from anything else that would happen or has happened in America. Uh, Maybe the European model and and, and how those uh, academies go. Uh, We brought 26 young men in here, including a men and a saw Thompson and professionalized them. And here we are two years later. Uh, We culminated this year with an extremely high level playoff series, which came after uh, a very competitive season. Uh, and it's just, you know, we, we 32 guys that have been here um, pouring into them every single day in all aspects of not just basketball and life and preparing them for, in this case, professional basketball, uh, but to be professionals in life. And so there's a lot of people here dedicated to their improvement. Uh, we spend a lot of time teaching them every aspect of the game and every aspect of life. And so uh, it's inevitable when you do that on a very consistent basis that there's uh, stock improvement on each one of their parts. And it's exactly what has happened here in the short two years that we've been doing this. You mentioned the Thompson twins there a moment ago. I want to start with Amon here for a moment. How have you kind of seen him grow and develop as a primary facilitator to this point? Well, you know, th- there there is what I would call uh, there are point guards. Um, there are point guards, which the NBA kind of specializes in now. And then there is a man. So I wouldn't necessarily call him a born to play the position point guard that are, that are so cerebral. The old John Stockton, Magic Johnson, those Mark Jackson kind of guys. Uh, and he he can... Uh, but he does so many other things that as a points guard will get you 32 points and 12 assists, you know, uh, a la Damian Lillard. He's so unique uh, because he brings so many attributes to the game. He's He's been growing, so he's probably over six seven now, and he's got long arms, but he's got a quick twitch muscle package with guys 12 inches shorter than him. So he can get through pick and roll spaces. He can make change of change of speed or change of pace or left to right or left to right movements like I haven't seen in a very long time, if if ever. Uh, and then he can make a pass on a dime, you know, like, oh, I didn't see that, you know, driving to his right, picking it up one hand to that left hand corner for a corner three, uh, falling out of bounds uh, underneath his own basket and throwing a pinpoint pass to half court uh right on time and right on target uh, and just doing things that his 
natural athleticism show that people would think as an athlete because you can run and jump that that's but in basketball terms he does so many things with his athleticism that that have a positive effect on the game and that position um requires that out of you to be able to move at a different pace and to be able to understand you know especially in today's game what what needs to be done i think he's made a tremendous amount of improvement in the cerebral part of that but also obviously in the movement and the athletic part of that. Now, Amin kind of occupied that primary facilitator role for, for your team. Uh, his brother, Asar, you know, does he have the same upside to maybe be a, a primary facilitator in the future and has playing next to his brother who's kind of occupied that role to this point, maybe masked some of his ability to be a, a creator a, a bit as well? Yeah, he, he's done that. And, and quite honestly, he's done that very, very well. And there are times that he, he probably turned the ball because it's not a natural. I, I, I think the way, you know, I... I, I it's funny because, you know, you watch the game, particularly uh, for, for really good teams, that uh, uh, a primary ball handler sometimes in the NBA because of the clock and some other things becomes a secondary ball handler. You know, if you, you bring the ball up, you distribute it somewhere, and then by the time you get it back, you're up against a shot clock. But what they've done is eliminate that first part of it. Miami Heat, for instance, give the ball to Adebayo coming up the court he goes into a pick and roll. By the time it gets to a primary ball handler like Kyle Lowry or Gabe Vincent or Jimmy Butler, they have more time to make those quality decisions. I think that role will fit Asar really well, uh, where he doesn't have to make the decision coming up to court as to what play to call or what defense to read and those kind of things. But by the time it gets into his hands, and we get into a pick and roll situation or, you know, a strong side situation, uh, he'll be able to do that. It's what we've practiced a lot here and something he'll be able to do at the next level. Coming up, addressing the shooting concerns for both Amin and Asara Thompson, as well as what makes them such special talents compared to some of the other lottery talent in this year's NBA draft. We're going to get there in just one moment. But first, today's episode is brought to you by FanDuel. Make a fast break to FanDuel during the NBA playoffs because right now new customers can get a no sweat first bet up to $2,500. That's $2,500 back in bonus bets if your first bet doesn't pay out. Right now you can take a look at the NBA Finals odds. The Denver Nuggets favorites to win the finals outright minus 460. The Miami Heat currently sitting at plus 350 and they got you covered for so many different odds over at FanDuel. Nikola Jokic to record a 60 plus, 65 plus PRA. That's points, rebounds, assists in any NBA Finals game. That's minus 125. And then on the opposite end of the spectrum, any Denver Nuggets player to score 60 plus points in a Finals game is currently going for plus 9,500. There's no better place to bet on all the playoff action than America's number one sports book. So be sure to visit FanDuel.com slash locked on and get a no sweat first bet up to $2,500. That's FanDuel.com slash locked on FanDuel official sports betting partner of the NBA. And continuing on here at Locked on Rockets, your daily podcast home for everything Houston Rockets basketball. Be sure to stay tuned in throughout the week and moving forward as we have you covered for all of the 2023 NBA draft information right here at LOR. Let's go ahead and dive right back into our interview with Overtime Elite City Reapers head coach David Lato. How would you, at this point, address maybe any concerns over the Thompson Twins and their kind of shooting profile at this point? Well... You know, I, I use examples. So um, Gildress Alexander for the Thunder did not, did not walk into the NBA as a shooter. Uh, he makes threes now, but he doesn't take a lot. His game is, is suited for so many other things that he does very well, leading the team, primary ball handler, athleticism, mid-range scorer, athletic finisher in the fast break. Uh, and so that dynamic – is, is something that will grow with both of them. And and DeJounte Murray, same way, you know, coming out of Seattle and then going to University of Washington when he entered the NBA in San Antonio. And to this day, he's not making his mark uh, as a shooter. Uh, but both over time have been able to make shots at an all-star level. And so I look at it the same for a man and a SAR and that they, they could be all NBA if they so choose, and it's required them as defenders. Um, their ability to, to rebound, run, block shots, 
you know, score at the basket to, to to so many other things that they do well, that because the premium is so important on shooting in today's game, that's what's talked about the most. But I'd like to I'd like to know and see where they'll be at, you know, four years from now when we're talking about it less, but it doesn't ever have to be their primary weapon of success. I love that. I love that because you you see plenty of players in today's NBA that, you know, shooting isn't their number one skill, number one, you know, tool in their bag. And they're still very highly impactful players. Besides the shooting, though, coach, when you look at uh, the Twins, what's going to be the biggest adjustment for them, uh, you know, going into the NBA level and kind of adjusting from OTE to NBA play? Yeah, I, I think, you know, anybody who comes in as a rookie has a huge adjustment, uh, the speed of the game, the physicality of the game, uh, they'll, they'll need to adjust to, to both of those things. Um, the nuances of playing, uh, with older guys and five out basketball, or it's a little bit non-traditional is something that, that they'll have to get used to, but some that we've tried to train them here on and, and, and then off the court, you know, how do they handle one life without each other potentially? And, and two, the lifestyle of a of an NBA player uh, for those moments when you're not in the gym because they're so used to spending you know double figure hours per day in in a gym, and what what will they do and how they adjust to the NBA lifestyle without being overwhelmed by it? You highlighted their athleticism a moment ago and how they they can both kind of utilize that to open up opportunities on the court that maybe other players don't see, but you know just kind of. What else do you think kind of separates these guys from some of the other prospects in this year's NBA draft? So, you know, I I, I look at, you know, the process of trying to draft a guy, particularly at the lottery level. And, and you'd like to almost assure yourself as an organization that you potentially get an all-star, right? That's what, that'd, be, that'd be nice. <laughs> that would be nice. And, and the stark reality of it is a lot of them don't become all-stars. Why is that? You know, when, when you see there's a, a particular talent that this young person has that you can translate to an all-star level player. Well, those intangibles sometimes are not seen, or if they are, they get lost in translation between the talent that, that you have to use to judge you know, whom or, or how or how you're going to draft somebody. So with with both of those guys, you know, and I and I say this all the time, they check a box at almost every level. You know, you you need uh, the highest quality individual to deal with the the highs, but most importantly, the lows and the failures that come with the NBA journey. Right, you got to have substance and substance as an individual, and they both rank at the highest possible level is that, uh, you know, how insatiable, not, not just having a work ethic, but how insatiable is your work ethic when you have so many other options now that you may never add in, in your life. Uh, and that is something that I, that I would put money down that they won't variate from that. They are dedicated to this game with anybody. And so, uh, there's, there, there's this interior component, you know, how much heart and soul do you have for competition? They have it at a very high level. What is your intellectual level to understand the game better, or understand the game of life better? They they check the box at a very high level. So those things that maybe get lost in the evaluation uh, are something that they will uh, over time show that they have an overabundance of when it comes to the ability to get better and better and better. Coming up, what are some of the examples of Amin and Asar Thompson's intangibles at play? And how can we expect these guys to grow and develop as they progress at the NBA level? We're going to get there in just one moment. And final segment here at Locked on Rockets, your daily podcast home for everything Houston Rockets basketball. As always, thank you for making LOR part of your day every single day. Let's go ahead and dive back into our interview with City Reapers head coach David Lato. I'm so glad you bring up the intangibles aspect of that because I think at times, you know, maybe, you know, basketball fans kind of get lost in some of, you know, just maybe treating the game like it's 2K, like it's a video game when these are living, breathing human beings with thoughts and emotions and, and feelings and all that. And that, that is very much an integral part of the game is how players, you know, approach the game outside of just what's happening on the court and how they grow as, as individuals, all that. Do you have maybe any examples of 
I, you know, maybe their, their leadership or you, you highlighted their work ethic, their competitive nature, anything that you can share with us to kind of point to and say, this is, this is the type of player that you're going to be potentially getting here. Yeah. So, um, I, in year one, I had, a, I had a saw, I didn't have a man on my team in year one. I had them both in, in year two. So, um, we had an instance with a SAR at the end of year one in our playoffs. So we had a little bit of an altercation and, you know, emotions got a little bit out of control and it wasn't expected. Uh, and it was un uncharacteristic for a SAR and, and a gentleman that, that he had an altercation with. And it was just more of a show of, of, of lack of maybe some maturity or, or the cup have spilled over with competitive spirit. So I fast forward to the playoffs this year and uh, same thing. I think there, you know, th there are a lot of guys here at OTE who are very talented uh, and a great pride in their talent, but don't have the same talent as the men in the SAR. And so, so what do you do? You challenge them, you challenge them. And because they're atypical as human beings, they they come from private school, uh, they can be almost a little nerdy at sometimes, to be honest with you. And, you know, they're not worldly. You know, they don't, they, they, they got paid a lot of money. They didn't never showed it. They don't wear flashy clothes or jewelry or things like that. So that is an avenue that somebody can go after. And that's what happened in competition is that in year two, particularly because they were together, that's how people you know, came after them. And they were very protective of each other. But the example is in, in game two, we had a five game series in game two. Uh, we were in dire straits. Score was was tied and we had a, a last second play drawn up. And a man just took it upon himself as the leader we were talking about. to just kind of one of the two options we had in, in the play that was designed to take it upon himself uh, to make that play and win the game. And not only was that uh, a, a very uh, strong moment in his advancement, but his humility and how it happened and why he did it and, and giving uh, uh, reference to his teammates and putting them in the right position showed a lot of growth over his time here. But then even the men in game three, uh, we were down one again in dire straits with about seven, six seconds to go. I can't remember exact time, drew up a play for a man uh, who ended up passing the ball to a SAR. When we go back to the shooting, uh, boy, they talk about the two guys not being able to shoot. And he he made a catch and shoot three with a couple of seconds left that culminated both his emotional growth and his physical growth and the time that it was needed the most. And he did it without hesitation. So structurally, emotionally, and every other way to see where – They've grown not just as basketball players and skill level, but as people has been nothing short of amazing. I know we, we, we talked about the shooting there momentarily, and you brought it up again just now with that that big-time shot by Asar. He made a, a pretty significant leap from year one to year two in his, his shooting percentage from behind the arc. What has been the biggest reason for his rapid development, and what does that maybe mean for addressing weaknesses down the line elsewhere in his game as he develops in the future? You know, shooting is a very delicate part of, of, of the game, both physically and psychologically. And so uh, having to make a significant change in the structure is not easy. You, know, you, have, you have to undo a lot of habits that that uh, both were used to, uh, but it wasn't working to the degree that it was going to you know, create the long term success. So it took a long time, both physically, but especially psychologically, to to accept that kind of structural change. And then to get used to a different way of shooting. Uh, and then the most important part is reps. You know, I don't know that we, we have a leaderboard and how many shots guys take during the course of a two week time. We update it every 10 days, two weeks. And both uh, a men and a SAR are at the top of the chart of the 32 guys that we've had. Of, of, you know, thousands and thousands of shots. And so there is no secret sauce to this improvement process that you have to go through, particularly when it comes to shooting. And then what, what it does do is lead to a tremendous amount of improved self-confidence. And that's where both of them are at. There's, there's still a ways to go, quite obviously, because they're so young. 
But as I said, you know, to go from 20 to 24, 25 years old and to see what kind of improvement they'll go through will speak to that self-confidence because they're not going to stop putting in the time and, and the reps that are necessary. For you personally, Coach, how, how is your coaching experience with OTE compared to some of the other stops that you had throughout your kind of coaching journey to this point? Yeah, it's been, it's been a, a, as I said, it's been a joy of a lifetime, to be honest with you. Um, high school is different than college. Uh, you get to create more of a foundation. Uh, you, you get, um, you know, in college, you're not the only teacher. You know, sometimes you have a junior and senior that help deliver the message. Here, the messaging is, is sometimes a first-time event, and it has to come exclusively from the coaches and skill development people. And so um, that's been a welcome change to be able to teach foundational you know, intricacies that go into not only their game, but it go into their life. And I think that's part of the pride that I've taken throughout my career is, is just teaching young men about life as well as the game of basketball. So this at this tender age that, that they think they know, but they don't really know has been a great time for me. And, and then the people here are just so wonderful uh, and a new entity that have given up. We have a lot of young people that work here. They've given up a career uh, to come here and they're looking forward to the next stage of their career by doing great work here. So uh, being able to receive and to pour into people here that work with our kids every day and then the young people uh, that we teach and coach every day has just been a joy of, of, of a lifetime for me. Coach, we really appreciate your invaluable insight into OTE, the Thompson twins, everything going on there. Is there anything else you want to share with our audience before we wrap things up? No, just for, for the people of Houston, if, if uh, you know, one of the two twins, uh, a man especially gets an opportunity to be drafted by the Rockets in you know, the tradition of the, of the organization, uh, the championship pedigree, uh, new coach, new culture, new system. I, I think it would be a tremendous marriage given the roster that's currently there, uh, the youthfulness and the direction that the uh, organization is headed. So I'll be one of the biggest fans of the Rockets from afar and, uh, and wish the best of luck. But uh, you, you'll be getting a tremendous, tremendous individual who has a world of potential, a world of talent. Coach, an absolute pleasure having you on the program. Thanks so much for stopping by. Thanks for having me. And that's going to do it for another edition of Locked on Rockets. As always, thank you so much for checking out the show. If you haven't done so yet, please consider subscribing wherever you listen to your podcast or on YouTube. Just go to YouTube, search Locked on Rockets. Be sure to like, comment, and subscribe. Give us your thoughts on Amin and Asar Thompson after hearing from Coach Lato and how you feel about these guys as prospects. Now, let us know in the YouTube comments. But as always, thank you so much for watching. Thank you so much for listening. And we look forward to having you back right here at Locked on Rockets, your daily podcast home for everything Houston Rockets basketball.